In week three of our exploration of introductory topics in sociology, uh, we're reading in chapter five about social groups and about formal organizations. The concept of groups are very powerful in our lives and um, all of us really belong to many different groups that have a very great influence upon not only where we go and who we see, but also how we think and how we feel and sometimes our attitudes and beliefs about life and the world around us and so it's very important to be able to identify what our groups are and to understand the basic uh, tenets and beliefs of those groups the basic things that those groups teach and organize themselves around um, because all of us uh, to one extent or another give up a certain amount of our individuality in order to belong to those groups and allow ourselves uh, to be led by those groups in, in our thinking. So one of the things we're going to start out with is taking a look at what are groups and what are not groups and, and there are differences. Uh, um, sociologists refer to not every collection of human beings as a group there are such things as aggregates or crowds and these are people who temporarily share space but really don't see themselves as belonging together um, I believe in our last lecture we talked a little bit about this though so for instance if you're in a stadium watching a professional football game or in a high school gymnasium watching a basketball game um, for that matter um, shopping for Christmas gifts in in a mall uh, in downtown Anchorage or wherever you may be uh, you're in a crowd. This is a group of people who are in one space together at one time, but they're not there for a, well, they may be there for a unified purpose, but they you really don't, the members of that crowd don't really see themselves as connected to each other, uh, don't really see them as sharing a group identity or anything of that nature. So you can see there's a difference there between, um, say, a group of people who are in, in a church together or who go to an AA meeting together or who sit in a classroom together. And for that matter, in a large classroom, probably um, you feel more like you belong in a crowd than in a, in a group anyway. Um, so these are, again, people, a crowd or an aggregate are people who temporarily share a space but don't really feel a connection to each other. Another type of... Um, um, collection of individuals or categories and these are people who share similar characteristics so all males belong to a category all females uh, white people black people Roman Catholics Protestants uh, Americans and Swahili and on and on and on these are these are categories of individuals elderly and youth who share similar characteristics but really don't um, don't have a connection otherwise to each other Groups, however, do share, uh, there are connections shared between people in groups. And first of all, we look at, at two different kinds of social groups. One is a, one type of group is a primary group. And Charles Cooley was a sociologist as a, a symbolic, an interactionist psych, uh, sociologist who referred to primary groups as the springs of life. Um, examples of primary groups would be your family to begin with. Um, this would perhaps include, depending upon how deeply you're involved in your religion and how large your, your religious groups are, it could be a religious group, it could be an AA group, um, it could be uh, a group of very close associates in your life, your best friends or your closest co-workers. And, and um, these are people, this is a group that's essential for our emotional well-being. Uh, and, and although this says <laughs> very impersonal, that's wrong and should say very personal. Um, and in, in these primary groups, we can be our true self. We can be who we really are. A primary group fills uh, emotional needs with, with the individual and, and uh, um, it gives them really, uh, in some respects, uh, some of their identity. Um, we tend to have intimate relationships and facts within groups and not necessarily sexual, sexually intimate in nature, but, but uh, intimate in terms of being, well, our true self, being able to reveal ourselves to our to other fellow group members. Uh, also, primary groups tend to be a good deal smaller than other types of groups. The other type of group, social group, is what we refer to as a secondary group, and this is where people come together on the basis of a mutual interest. Now, this could be this could be your church group if if you belong to a larger uh, church community, for instance. Uh, it could be your work group. It may be um, uh, it could be uh, the National Rifle Association. It could be Ducks Unlimited. Uh, you know, these are kinds of things where people come together because they have some interest or some particular. Um, 
thing to to focus upon um, but but they're really not drawing emotional strength from each other um, these tend to be more formal than primary groups one reason being that they tend to be larger and the larger the group the more the group needs rules in order to be able to function successfully um, Sometimes members interact on the basis of statuses in these secondary groups so that there may be individuals who are leaders uh, or who are, you know, have a particular uh, a special status in the group that uh, separates them and, and maybe leads to them organizing certain things in the, in the group, for instance. So these groups uh, sometimes are organized to get things done, accomplish a task. Sometimes they're organized around particular interest areas, but they're really not there to meet the, intima the intimacy needs of, of, um, of its members. Also, within uh, if, if you look at uh, social groups, your social groups from another way, there's another way of, di of uh, dividing them up, and that's in-groups and out-groups. So an in-group is any group that a person may feel loyalty towards. Um, so your in-groups, again, if you're connected to your family, would certainly be your family, but might also be other people of your own age. It could be other people of your political organization. It might be people who enjoy the same kind of music as you. Uh, in-groups might be somebody who promotes a social cause that you're connected to or or again a um, particular group who espouses ideas that you believe in. Outgroups on the other hand are people well that belong to other groups that hold op opposing points of views or who um, you don't really um, associate yourself with at all. So as much as we may not like to see this in fact um, we often divide our world into in-groups and out-groups. Now there are uh, both positive and negative consequences of in-groups and out-groups. For instance, uh, with an in-group, you know, you do feel a sense of belonging with the in-group, and um, uh, but uh, the out-group uh, also sometimes can can develop intense rivalries, so that. Um, it can sometimes become counterproductive. You get this kind of us versus them mentality. Um, the interesting thing about um, in groups and out groups, for instance, leaders can sometimes, and and I believe the text writes about this that uh, Hitler, for instance, made uh, made very good use of the in group and out group thing here by by um, well helping the Germans uh, during the Second World War to, or in the years leading up to that at least, to feel better about themselves and strong uh, by. Uh, identifying them as the master race and all those individuals who didn't belong to those groups were then ostracized and so um, in a sense it built solidarity within the in-group by identifying people in the out-group who were trying to assault the interests of the individuals in the in-group or who were hurting the people in the in-group the the master race so so this is one of the things that um, also sometimes you'll find this um, in children's camps, I think there's a study that's mentioned about this that uh, the the kids are grouped in cottages and when they go to camp and and their leader kind of builds their connection between among the members of their cottage with competitions with other cottages, whether it be you know on the soccer field or it might be which cottage cleans their cabin the best or something along that line that that helps to build a connection between its members, um, although possibly at the expense of of making people from outside that in group feel as uh, seem to be. Uh, um, a, a part of the other side. We also have uh, groups that are known as reference groups and these are ones that we use to evaluate ourselves. Um, as we go through our life our reference group may change uh, and sometimes our reference groups may contradict the values of other groups. Now what are reference groups? Well, for one thing, the interesting thing about a reference group is, is you don't really have to belong to a reference group for it to be a reference group. It just is something you want to belong to. So that uh, if you're a young uh, boy, for instance, and you um, you want to play professional basketball someday, you may identify with uh, some of the the pro the professional basketball players and emulate them and dress like them and talk like them and buy the products that they endorse on television and those kinds of things because you want to be like them. In fact, there used to be a little thing about uh, boys wanting to be like Mike Michael Jordan and and. Uh, that's that's really a, a an individual or a group a reference a group that you, you're aspiring to belong to and and again it's just enough that you want to be there they can, that uh, individuals oftentimes will shape themselves around the values of this particular group in order to aspire to be a member. 
um, in um, of course, as we talked about last week, you know, we were talking about social revolutions in the advent of the the uh, the uh, information age and the latest social revolution, thanks to the computer chip. We talked a little bit about how um, um, styles and and uh, definitions of intimacy and interactions with other individuals are changing dramatically uh, nowadays with people connecting online participating in chat rooms uh, joining social networks such as Facebook and um, joining even business networks on uh, in, online and everything to share resumes and things like that um, there there are new social groups that are forming now these electronic communities that that people find a connection with to a certain extent they can be very impersonal oftentimes they fail to meet the needs of intimacy um, but at other times it appears as though they they do and I would say appear I, I'm not sure that they really do but perhaps they do uh, meet the needs of intimacy in other situations talk a little bit about formal organizations uh, this there's quite a bit of time spent on this in in the chapter and I'm not going to go into bureaucracies too deeply in this uh, this lecture but uh, Max Weber was the one who ac actually studied bureaucracies quite a bit bureaucracies are everywhere for us and we all have to deal with bureaucracies um, whether you know you're trying to get your driver's license and you're st sitting in line for that or or you um, you know you perhaps like if um, uh, you want to get married you have to apply for a marriage license you have to wait so many days you have to do this and you have to do that uh, those kinds of things even you know whether it's not government sometimes bureaucracies involve the church um, those kinds of things so any large organization oftentimes will find itself organizing into a bureaucracy and there are reasons for that there are there are characteristics of a bureaucracy as you should be familiar with first and that is that they there are clear-cut levels uh, in the bureaucracy there are there are um, you know management there's uh, mid-level management there are workers there are assistants and those that type of thing so there are different levels in a bureau in bureaucracy that defines what each person does um, in in that and what responsibilities that individual has in that in that organization next there is a division of labor so that uh, uh, certain individuals specialize in certain areas and and uh, because they're specializing in those areas um, in theory at least they become uh, better at that and they refine their skills and so um, they uh, carry out those duties more efficiently and this is one reason one way that bureaucracies are thought to be better uh, at carrying out especially complex tasks uh, that are difficult when, when there are many different parts to a task many different things that have to happen uh, sometimes it's felt bureaucracies are the best for those kinds of tasks because they divide labor they, they divide specializations I should say and um, uh, can sometimes get the job done more efficiently that way because they're so large bureaucracies often have to have written rules um, policy and procedures uh, manuals those kinds of things that that define what a person should do in in a certain situation as much as possible uh, bureaucracies try to anticipate everything that might occur and oftentimes will have these rather large uh, books and collections of documents that define how the individual should respond there should be consistency in response and predictability in the response this of course uh, becomes a problem for an individual who who comes to a bureaucracy with a need that isn't isn't contemplated in the policy and procedure manual for instance or who somehow doesn't fit into the, the kind of the norm for individuals to come to them and that's where a lot of the frustration comes when we have our own personal individual needs that don't quite fit into the structure of things and and uh, we become very frustrated sometimes with bureaucrats in those situations um, they tend to have written communication and records uh, this helps to um, the written communication and records help to continue that bureaucracy beyond the individuals the lives of the individuals within it um, this group continues uh, even with the total turnover of everybody in it because there are written rules written communication written records that kind of take their own life and so in, in many respects the persons who fill those niches in a the bureaucracy they're certainly interchangeable and and um, uh, business goes on after they leave um, and also they're impersonal I, I, bureaucracy uh, 
um, if if you have again, as I mentioned, a reference a little bit a little bit ago. I mean, if you have an individual need that that kind of falls outside the norm for the bureaucracy, that isn't necessarily true that the bureaucracy that the individual there is going to be able to take care of it or will take care of it. And so, um, again, oftentimes the source of a great deal of frustration and anger with individuals who have to deal with the bureaucracy. Because of the written rules and all those kinds of things, the bureaucracies uh, tend to take a life of their own on. You know, they, they continue to function. And sometimes some people believe function even after they're no longer useful. Um, uh, sometimes the goal displacement is one of the things that uh, Hensley writes about. Sometimes bureaucracies will, uh, will develop new goals when an old goal has been accomplished. Again, perhaps the bureaucracy should kind of fade from existence at that point, but because it, it just has kind of developed its own existence, you know, it finds new things to do and, and new directions to go. Uh, another characteristic of bureaucracy is red tape, which again will often, you know, these, these kind of steps you have to go through in order to get something accomplished, in order to get something from the bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Red tape, again, is, is one of those kind of things that are very frustrating about, about uh, um, bureaucracies to individuals, both those that are working within it as well as those trying to deal with it. But the red tape, uh, as it's called, is really a part of the, the uh, structure of making sure that things are done properly and in a certain format. And so in that respect, the bureaucracy, again, that's one of, another one of those positive things about a bureaucracy, I suppose, is, is that it, it can guarantee consistency and predictability. And uh, when, when you have an organization that isn't so well, uh, where responsibilities aren't so well defined and, and uh, uh, steps to be taken aren't so clearly spelled out sometimes it um, it can be very unpredictable in its results and so bureaucracies at least uh, will usually at least have give some predictability um, to, to uh, requests and, and things like that now we want to look a little bit at uh, group dynamics and uh, just some of the things um, that go on within groups and and that that have an impact upon how people interact within groups. And uh, if you really want to think about it, if you want to draw a um, a map of a group, if you have two people, uh, say that people are represented by dots, then um, you have two people with a line between the two of them. That's called a dyad. That's two people. When you have a triad, three people you have three dots and a line separating each of the three dots and and so then as this group increases in size um, it, it becomes more complicated and more complex there are more relationships within the group and so because of that one of the things that tends to occur is the group will become more formal and and because of the need to to introduce some predictability and structure to the group uh, you know in order to keep it going because it can get chaotic if there isn't some sort of uh, structure uh, and that formality tends to make the larger group more stable as well um, think also about the fact that if you have a group of two people one person leaves that that dyad um, what what comes of the group the group is over there is no longer a group with three people if one person leaves um, the other two may continue their connection and may still have uh, so to speak have the, the group continues to survive but it, but it really is impacted significantly by the absence of one-third of its membership and so you can see the larger the group the less powerful each individual is within that group I mean all things being equal in general with the the influence of the individuals being equal at least that the larger the group the less it's impacted by people coming and going and so that's why larger groups are more stable in larger groups though one of the things that tends to happen because we look for um, we look for people that are similar to us and we look for uh, for some uh, way to have some influence I suppose uh, coalitions may sometimes begin to form where you have little subgroups that form inside the larger groups and and sometimes they can be useful sometimes they can be detrimental to the larger group in a larger group there is this um, phenomena that goes on it's called a diffu diffusion of responsibility uh, this is where the notion that somebody else is going to take care of it um, 
in some respects, uh, this is called social loafing. And uh, you hear about this sometimes. And when you um, when you begin your group project in the class, uh, my prediction is that um, a few of your groups are going to have social loafers. These are people who, yeah, they're not going to really respond much when you write to them. They uh, really aren't too worried about doing things the way the group wants them to do. They'll just get around to it when they do, if 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 they get around to it. I mean, I, I hate to tell you this, but I know this is going to happen in a couple of groups because I've seen this happen, despite my best efforts to make sure everybody participates and, and does so in a timely manner, uh, and despite your best efforts. And this is social loafing. This is uh, the notion that somebody else can take care of this duty. And again, you can imagine the larger the group, the greater that problem becomes to where, um, you know, in a larger group, you'll, I I've seen this, for instance, in, in the classroom setting in face to face classes. <clears throat> when, um, if I have a, if I've had a class of six or seven students, pretty generally, I can expect that everybody will participate, will speak up, will carry their fair share of the interaction with me as the instructor during the class time. But when I have a class of 30, um, usually there is a gr core group of seven or eight people who do a lot of the talking, a lot of ask a lot of the questions. Um, and, you know, the other um, 20 people in the classroom are very content to allow it to be that way, just to let them do the work. And in fact, You'll see oftentimes in larger classrooms, you'll see people breaking away with their little laptops and clearly not taking notes. But, you know, by the facial expression, the instructor can see they're in chat rooms or, or uh, you know, something like that. Um, and so sometimes people are kind of whispering each other, you know, throughout the classroom. That's sort of that little coalition going there or whatever. But the bottom line is, is that the larger the group, the less responsible individuals feel within the group to, to carry out the tasks of the group. Um, and as a, there, there is, um, and just a, as an aside in this, I, um, this diffusion of responsibility. There was, I don't know if this is still in the new text or not, the new edition of the text or not, but uh, back in the 1960s, uh, there was, um, I remember this from uh, from the news. In fact, uh, during those times, there was a woman who um, was assaulted in New York City in, in a courtyard in a large apartment complex. And there were uh, dozens and dozens of apartments that looked down into this courtyard. And in the presence of individuals who heard her screams as she was being assaulted, people coming to their windows, this woman was assaulted and um, nobody called the police. And in fact, after she was assaulted, uh, as, I under as I recall this story, the attacker came back uh, and, and murdered her and no one had contacted the police at all. And so um, this is just considered a, you know, a horrible example of the impersonality of, of life in the city. This is certainly, this is Gesellschaft to its extreme, you know, that, that notion of not knowing your neighbor and, and not being connected. But, but when you think of it, 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 of course, it's a stretch to kind of think of people living in this apartment complex as a group, but the idea of diffusion, diffusion of responsibility is illustrated pretty clearly there. Everybody standing there thought somebody else is going to call the police and nobody bothered to do that. Nobody made the effort themselves. And that is a sort of diffusion of responsibility at its worst. Uh, also, another uh, concept in, in uh, groups is what it was referred to in the 60s, at least, as groupthink. And this is this idea that, uh, you know, that uh, as a group begins to form an opinion about things, its members all form the same opinion and they begin to see the world in that way. And they, they develop this sort of this tunnel vision uh, that doesn't allow the, uh, any new ideas to be introduced into, into the group. And so the group just continues on in whatever direction it's going, despite many signs and symptoms that it should probably correct itself somehow. Uh, groupthink was considered to be part of the reason why uh, in the Lyndon Johnson uh, cabinet in the 1960s um, that the Vietnam War that we just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper into a war that w many people knew we weren't going to be able to win and uh, groupthink had a lot to do with that. The, the great minds who may have at one time opposed it kind of started going along with it and seeing it as as uh, the right thing to do, the only choice we had, so to speak, even when other people were coming with other ideas. Now here's a good example of, of how 
what can happen is groups get bigger. As you can see from a dyad, a group of two to a group of seven, just how complicated uh, each uh, of those groups become. You know that there's one relationship in a dyad, but by the time you get to a group of seven, there are 21 relationships. And um, each of those relationships has an impact upon how the group functions. So there's a lot of uh, emotional tending, let's say, and uh, social tending that has to go on in those groups for, for a group to get along well. And of course, the larger the group gets, the more difficult it becomes to maintain those relationships successfully. And so that's why groups need structure and leaders and, and need to separate out into maybe some objectives and goals as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. If you think about this in your home, if you belong to a large family, you, you know, you can see sometimes maybe why it can be, well, it can be more difficult, more complicated for everybody to get along. But at the same time, if, if you're in a family of two or three and one person is having a bad day or is upset about something or angry, it really changes the tone a great deal. And, and especially, um, well, in a triad, oftentimes it's felt that one person is always cut out you know, in a group of three anyway, but, but in a dyad, certainly if you live with just one other person and that person's having a horrible day or they're angry uh, with you, you really have nowhere else to turn, you know, in a group of seven, in a family of seven, you have six other relationships you can move to. And so, so the emotional needs sometimes of those members um, may be lost in, in a group of seven, but at the same time, um, the the unhappiness or the discomfort of one person in that group doesn't necessarily change the functioning of the larger group as powerfully as it does in smaller groups. You can see that, I think. So so larger groups in particular will need leaders. And, and uh, we talk a little bit about leaders and types of leaders. Um, you can really, first of all, think of leaders as being two different types in, in, a, in a particular group. Um, you have all these relationships within a group, so there are emotional needs of the group, so to speak, that have to be taken care of. But at the same time, the larger groups in particular, um, whether it be a bureaucracy or a smaller work group, whatever, tend to be organized around some task, something that's supposed to be accomplished. And so leaders have to lead people to get the task accomplished. They have to lead that group to accomplish the task to be effective. But at the same time, uh, a leader has to also be able to take care of the emotional needs of its members so that everybody can contribute to the larger task. Um, so you see two different leaders we're talking about here. One, the instrumental leader, who is the person who, the leader who keeps the group on track towards meeting its goals, sort of the taskmaster. Um, the expressive leader is the other kind of, of leader who, who um, and I should say, tries to lift the group's morale. Um, gosh, I should edit these a little more closely. The expressive leader tries to lift the group's morale through, through motivation um, and might also be an instrumental leader. The, now, uh, I think the text suggests that, that uh, m many people believe, at least, that you can't be both. A leader can't be both instrumental and expressive. Um, that that little thing about also being able to be an instrumental leader probably was my my own little addition to this to this thing because um, I do believe you can be both. It, it takes a it isn't easy to do. It's a balancing act, but um, it's sort of like make sure you get this job done at any cost because the job has to get done um, versus oh, I know you're having a bad day today and I understand that your mind is preoccupied with something else. So take a day off and, you know, come in tomorrow, you'll feel better and, you know, that kind of thing. That's sort of what an expressive leader might do. I understand the instrumental leader is like, get it done. And so it's a, oftentimes those two goals in leadership contradict each other. And uh, it, it takes a good leader to be able to do both. But I do believe one person can do both. But what happens a lot of times, especially in larger organization, again, where you have a sort of a division of, of responsibility and, and uh, you know, um, orders kind of flow from the top. Um, Sometimes that instrumental leader, the task-oriented leader, gets separated from the from uh, the emotions of the group because he's he or she is just focused on getting the job done, um, and not having an expressive leader 
are not getting that leadership from from him what happens a lot of times then is the the workers will look to somebody else to become their expressive leader and so they find a supportive person within their group perhaps or at a mid-level or something like that um, who becomes sort of a separate leader and and uh, uh, if that person doesn't work closely with the instrumental leader, it can become a very divisive kind of thing within the organization. And uh, the expressive leader sort of can become to develop as sort of this little cabal or whatever that uh, just uh, works to undermine what the instrumental leader is trying to accomplish. It becomes very dysfunctional in those spots. So it's essential that these two leaders, if there are two indeed, work together closely. There are different leadership styles as well. Not so much types of leaders, but, but leadership styles. And you see them here, authoritarian, democratic. Sometimes the democratic style is referred to as, the, as the authoritative, as opposed to authoritarian, and laissez-faire. You probably know the authoritarian is really somebody who kind of gives instructions, takes no information in, uh, isn't interested in other people's opinions about things. The authoritarian leader said, these are the rules and you will comply with these rules and you will get this done and you will do it by this time and I don't want any excuses for it not getting done. That's the authoritarian leader. Uh, at the opposite end of that spectrum, the laissez-faire leader, laissez leader really kind of has hands off altogether the task, uh, kind of even lets the group lead and may not even set the goal for the group for that matter. Um, may tell the group, you guys get together and decide what we're going to accomplish for a second and third and um, I'm just here to help you with that. And uh, so this is really a very hands-off kind of, of thing. And um, having worked in a number of different agencies and bureaucracies over the years, I can tell you sometimes while the laissez-faire attitude may, uh, laissez-faire leader may create a kind of a relaxed environment in the work site over a period of time, it becomes evident that, um, well, except in extraordinary circumstances where you have a, a very motivated and organized people, uh, with a, a totally laissez-faire leader, sometimes, you know, the group kind of veers from its objectives and doesn't get things done. And I have participated in meetings where, where um, a group of seven or eight professionals sit around a table d debating where a clock is going to get hung on a wall for 15 minutes. Uh, just that's what happens sometimes when somebody doesn't make a decision. So in between the authoritarian and the laissez-faire and each have their problems, of course, um, is the democratic leader and the democratic or again authoritative leader is the person who works to try to get group consensus um, this is the the leader who who does set goals for the group uh, but perhaps get feedback gets feedback from its members before the goal is set uh, this is the leader who kind of directs how things are going to get done but listens closely to the input from the group uh, and uh, just how possible it is or isn't to to do those things that kind of thing so the democratic leader gets input seeks input incorporates it and then leads based upon that that's a hard thing to do. It's not easy to lead that way, but that, in many respects at least, is thought to be the most effective leader. Now, is this a sociology class that's based on global uh, ideas? Probably not so much, because, the, of course, the Democratic leader would seem to be the best option in the United States of America, which believes itself to be a democracy at least. You understand that in other nations and other in other parts of the world uh, the authoritarian leader may seem to be the most effective and the best type but but for Americans at least the democratic leader is the one we tend to prefer. Now one thing um, a leader might change his, his or her styles based upon the situation so that there are times when um, a group may need an authoritarian a direction or there are times when the group may need somebody who kind of just lets them back off and take care of things themselves you know or th there may be times when the group can give input and other times when they can't really collect themselves enough to make a decision within them to give to their leader so um, the leadership style, leadership style is often going to change based upon the situation Now, just a little bit here, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, uh, dynamics and effects that um, being a member of a group can have upon you and your thinking. 
This is the Solomon Ash experiment and uh, about conformity in a group. And uh, I'm going to try to relay this to you in a way that um, you know is correct, if I remember this correctly. But you may have studied about this in other classes that you've had, particularly psychology, introductory psychology classes. But an individual um, a leader, let's say, or the um, the leader of the class has has uh, eight students come into class and and holds up two cards. The first card is the card one and then holds up card two and asks the eight people in the class to identify which line um, A, B, or C most closely matches the line that's on card one. Now, the answer is pretty easy when you look at this, right? So you're one of these eight people and um, the first time around um, everybody says A and everything is all wonderful with the world. Okay, Puts the cards down um, picks them up again, identify which is the same. Again, you go around the room and everybody says A is the one. Puts the card down, picks it up again, and uh, once again the uh, the answers repeat themselves and everybody um, everybody agrees uh, that that A is the right answer. But um, here in um, the fourth go around, uh, the first student says that B is the is the correct answer. Now you know that A is the right answer, right? So something seems amiss here. The second student says B. The third student says B. The fourth student says B. You're number five. Uh, you say, well, A is the right answer. Six and seven both say B. Hmm. Kind of interesting, isn't it? You know, and and so this goes on, and and it each pass around everybody else in the group decides that B is the correct answer. So the question is, what do you do with your answer? You know, everybody in the group basically is making you feel like you're crazy, but you know you're not. Well, this is the point of the experiment, to see how well people will stick with what they believe in and what they know to be the truth in the face of, of other opinions, uh, particularly when the group as a whole develops a, a consensus different from one's own. And I think the experiment, the, the upshot of this was that only something like 28% of people in this experiment will stick with the answer they know is right, that, that um, to one extent or another, um, the other... Um, uh, you know, well, one third uh, um, gives into the group half the time, even though they they uh, they know it's the wrong answer, and another uh, forty percent give wrong answers, but not quite as often say as the first third. So so again, you know, you got twenty eight percent of the students, uh, or twenty five percent of the students, something like that, who are who are um, um, sticking to their guns and giving the right answer all the time. And the point of this is, of course, is how you know, the opinions of everybody else in the group, how sometimes people will say things um, that they don't believe, who will, um, you know, that, um, that sometimes the group can be so powerful that most people are willing to say things that they know aren't true, that conforming to the group becomes more important than sticking with the truth. And so that's the that's the Solomon Ash experiment. And again, it's kind of scary when you think about that, and you think about that in terms of human relationships and and all those kinds of things. Um, so the Ash study uh, studied the effects of peer pressure, and uh, with well, it said six stooges. I was thinking seven is, I guess, what I was thinking we had. But in any event, uh, you get the idea. The the non stooge. Um, Actually, I think it's one stooge and six non-stooges. If you get right down to it, is it, the, the stooge is the person who uh, you know he's being tricked into saying things. But another study that uh, talked about some of the effects of, of uh, uh, well conformity and pressures in groups and things was the Milgram Stanley Milgram experiment, where he studied the effects of authority figures on individuals. And uh, you are going to read about this later in the semester. But uh, the Milgram experiments really are very, very famous experiments that were conducted, uh, I think, back in the 1940s or 50s. And if I remember this story correctly, Stanley Milgram, um, um, it must have been after the Second World War, wanted to go to Europe, uh, wanted to go to Germany to study um, you know, to conduct some experiments with Germans to find out what it is uh, about their particular personality or nature that led to them following um, Hitler and, uh, you know, giving into, uh, you know, 
you know, being supportive of him, even though uh, he was doing such horrible things to people and, and espousing such terrible ideology and those kinds of things. And so he wanted to see what it was in the nature of the German individual that would allow them to, to give in to this kind of authority, even when they knew that there was evil being, pro, uh, being practiced by that person, by that authority and by this regime. So he set up some experiments, I think around Cambridge, Massachusetts, really, to, with a college students and people from the community just to kind of try the experiment out over here first to see if he needed to refine any of his techniques. And the results of his of his tests uh, in a college university town in the United States were so horrifying to him. He never went to Europe. He, he never felt the need to do that. And what he found out that Americans as well will give in to authority uh, even when they know they're hurting another person. And and uh, I'll I'll let it go at that right now and We'll study more about that as the semester goes along. You can read a little bit more about it in the textbook. It was a very controversial experiment, and it kind of gets back to some of the things we were talking about last week in research in the fact of using human beings as experimental subjects. And this experiment really did have the potential for creating some real emotional harm to its subjects and has been widely criticized because of that. So that that will that will conclude our discussion about uh, group think and group group, I would encourage you to um, spend some time over the next week thinking about the groups that you belong to and thinking about what the principles are in those groups and, and consider how they impact your own thinking and how they shape your view of the world. Like, keeping in mind, of course, that the view of reality that we have in some respects are shaped by the groups that we belong to. That That human reality is real to us because we belong to those groups but it won't be real to people who don't belong to those groups and and uh, this can begin to give you an idea of why it is perhaps that individuals may live in a common community and on a, on a share the globe and share a nation and share a community and yet not agree with things on a uh, you know at all and so just some things for thought it's it's good for you to know where you come from and what what your influences are um, because the more you know what is uh, unique to you, the better able you're going to be able to understand uh, the uniqueness in other individuals as well. Okay, well that's it for this week, and uh, let me know if there's any questions or problems that come up associated with the material. Um, oh, a reminder, by the way, uh, you're going to find test three in your uh, in your weekly course content. I'm sorry, test one <laughs> in the week three weekly course content. Um, it will appear on Thursday of, of the week that this lecture opens on Sunday, so it'll be four days after this lecture opens, the test will appear in week three. And will stay open for 11 days, so don't miss it. Okay, thanks. Talk to you next week.